commonly referred to as GWA physics. I hope you noticed that I've got on a special outfit. Today is tacky Christmas sweater day and my wife gave me this and said, I dare you to wear it. So here I am with the kitties all over the sweater. Okay, so today's episode, let's talk about springs, okay? Um, when I draw a picture of a spring uh, in a problem, it kind of looks a little bit like a slinky, which is kind of a spring in itself. And one of the things about springs is that they can be stretched. So in one of the problems that we worked, it showed the spring kind of stretched out because there was a weight put on the spring which causes it to stretch. There's other kinds of springs that will compress or they will be, they'll be mushed together and gotten shorter. And in either situation, the, how much they stretch or how much force it takes to stretch or compress them is based on a characteristic of the spring that's called the spring constant, okay? Now, that was first discovered or determined by Robert Hooke and it's called Hooke's Law. So Hooke's Law states that F equals KX. Now, let's take that apart. The K is the spring constant. It's a numerical value that determines how stiff or how loosely the spring operates. For example, you got a spring in most ballpoint pens. Doesn't take much effort to push the button on that ballpoint pen to, to get the ink to come out. On the other hand, there's a spring that you find underneath the four corners of your car, and that's quite stiff, and that spring would, would probably have a K value that is quite large, okay? Secondly, there's your spring constant. X is the value that tells you how much the spring compressed or stretched, and that value has to be in meters. Now, if you look at my picture right quick, this is the natural length of the spring. When I put the weight on it, it stretched down to here. So the amount of stretch is this distance right here, and we label that as X. And last but not least, we're interested in the force. Now, we've talked about forces before. The force is measured in newtons. So if we take this line right here and say that this is 400 grams, okay, 400 grams, then one of the conversions that we had is that for every 100 grams is equal to one newton. That was one of those quick on the fly conversions that we used. But we also have that F of G, which is the weight, is equal to M times G. Now, in order for you to plug 400 into that equation, you've got to convert it to kilograms. So right away, this value is 0 0.40 kilograms. And G, of course, has always been 10 in our class. And so that would be four newtons. Now, either way, 100 divided into 400 is four. So that's gonna be a force in the down direction of four newtons. Now, let's make up a number right quick and let's say that this has stretched uh, 15 centimeters, which is 0.15 meters. And they ask you, what is the K value? Okay, so we're gonna come over to the equation, like always, and we're gonna plug in the numbers directly below the letters. And you can see that the thing that we don't know is K. So we'll divide this side by 0.15, We'll divide this side by 0.15, and 
that will give us the K value. Let me run those numbers right quick. We got four divided by 0.15 equals K is going to equal 26.6 repeating. Now the units for K are going to be Newtons divided by meters. And you can see that's exactly what happened. The Newtons were divided by meters. So that's the first part of springs. The second part of springs, let me see if I can get an eraser here right quick. The second part of springs has to do with their ability to oscillate. The word oscillate means to, it might be to bounce up and down. So you, maybe you can picture this on the video. You've got a spring and you've got a weight attached to it already and it's already stretched and it's sitting perfectly still. If you grab a hold of the weight and you pull down ever so slightly. In class, we did a lab like this on PHET. And when you pull down on it, it's going to cause the spring to stretch a little bit more. But when you let go of it, it starts bouncing up and down and up and down and up and down like this. Well, in the lab that we did, we were interested in solving for the period. Now, the period, which is capital T for period, is the time it takes to bounce up and down once, okay? It's like other forms of, of, of time that are correspond directly with an event taking place. So the period for the spring is up and down once. If we use another uh, problem that we talked about, you got a ball hanging from a string and you pull it over here to the side like this. When you let it go, it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It's got what we call pendulum action and going over and back once is called the period for the pendulum. But getting back to the spring, there's a formula that says that T is equal to two pi square root of M over K, where M is the mass in kilograms that's on the spring. And of course, we just learned about the K value. That's the, the characteristic of that spring. And based on those two quantities, the mass and the K value, you should be able to solve for T. So let's start out with an easy one. Let's say that this is 0.5 kilograms as the mass on the spring, and the K value is 45. Now I'm just making these numbers up, so we'll have to see how it comes out. So you're going to plug into the equation 0.5 on the top and 45 on the bottom. And then we're going to divide it and then we're going to take the square root second. So we got 0.5 divided by 45 equals 0 0.01111 repeating. And then we still take the square root of that. And that comes out to be 0. 105, and I'm going to keep three significant figures there. And then we still have to multiply that by 2 pi. Now in class, I just use 6.28. Some people use on their calculator, use the pi button, so our answers might vary just ever so slightly. So 6.28 times 0. 0.105 is 0.66. So the final answer is 0.66 seconds. So the time it takes to come up and back will be 0.66 seconds. Now, that's usually in the lab, that's pretty hard to start and stop the stopwatch. So what we learned to do was to let it bounce up and down 10 times. And then once we got the value on the stopwatch for 10, then we divided by 10 and got a good average value. In class, 
this same problem, we ask the students to solve for the K value based on the period. Well, that means that the K is underneath this radical, and we're trying to solve for K, and all we know is the mass and we know the period. So one of the things we should do is we should rearrange that formula algebraically. And so you've got T is equal to 2 pi square root of M over K. And I wanted to show you this math because I think it's important. In order to get rid of the radical sign, you have to square everything that's in the formula. So we're going to square this, we're going to square this, and we're going to square this. Well, what we get is T squared is equal to 4 pi squared M over K. Notice that K is in the denominator. So we're going to multiply K to both sides, which causes this to cancel. Now we have KT squared is equal to 4 pi squared M. Divide this side by T squared, divide this side by T squared, that one cancels, and we've isolated K by itself. So the formula that we're going to use to solve for K is 4 pi squared M, make sure mass is in kilograms, T squared, which is the time in seconds, like this value over here. Does everybody understand? Now, you could use the exact same equation and solve for M, but now we're going to move all the variables to the other side and isolate M by itself. If you have any questions about that, come see me before class or before school. Now, let's talk one more thing about springs. Everything I've shown you so far is vertical. Now, we had problems where we drew the spring horizontally like this. This should remind you off a lot of a pinball machine because if you remember, on a pinball machine, you pull back on the knob, so you have to apply a force to the knob, and when you do that, it's going to shorten the spring, or it's going to compress the spring. Now, when you do that, that stores energy in the spring. And what we learned in class was that the potential energy of the spring was equal to one-half kx squared. So how much energy you have stored in the spring ready to be released to do some work or to provide energy for another object? Like in the pinball machine, you normally have a ball here. So when, the, when you let go of the knob, then the ball goes flying into the pinball game. Well, let's look at this equation. K is still the spring constant. We know, we know how to deal with it. We know how to solve for K. And X is still the stretch or the compression in meters. And so just the only thing that I've seen that students forget to do is to square it sometimes in their math problem. Now, last but not least, I've seen where students have made some math errors with this fraction one half. So if you're one of those people that you're not sure if you're doing that one half correctly, just change it to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 kx squared, because 0 0.5 is the decimal value for the fraction one half. And then mathematically, you'll make sure that you do the right thing with that 0 0.5 and you multiply or divide when it's supposed to be multiplied or divided, but you don't accidentally take half of something when you really can't do that. Questions about that? Now, Last, the very last thing I want to say is that the energy that's stored in the spring when you pull back on the knob is going to be transferred to the kinetic energy of the ball. Okay? So whatever energy you've got stored in that spring, you pull the knob back on the pinball machine. You don't even think about it. And then when you let go, 
the energy that's in the spring is transferred to the ball. The ball goes rolling out into the game with a certain velocity. And the reason that's true is because kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And that formula for that is one half of mv squared. So based on the mass of the ball and the velocity, we can figure out how fast the ball's moving into the game. Or in the case of some of those problems we've worked in class, there was a block here and it went sliding to the right. So that's how that situation is worked. Now, as far as I can tell, that's everything that we've learned about springs. Springs can be vertical where they're hanging up and down, but springs can also be horizontal where they're sitting like this and they can, they can provide some energy for another object to move. Uh, we can apply forces to springs when they're horizontal, just like we provide forces to springs when they're vertical.